ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿನೋಸ್ವಸ್ತಿನೋಸ್ವಸ್ತಿನೋಸ್ವಸ್ತಿನೋಸ್ವಸ್ತಿನೋಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ
Yeah, this is Indra, this is Agni, Ganesha, Skanda, or Muruga, or Shanmukha. So these are all the names of deities that comes in our Sanatana Dharma. And these are all the deities that are also there in most of the Hindu temples. Most of the temples that we all visit will have a combination of these deities along with a, a supreme Brahman himself with Lakshmi. So these are all the uh, you know people who will be there. You call them as Parivara Devatas, of course. But I have a small question here. Yeah. How many devatas, how many deities or how many demigods or how many divinities are there or, or have been described in Sanatana Dharma? Of course, Brahman is only one, that is Vishnu who is only one. Shri Tattva or Lakshmi is again only one. But there are so many other deities that have been described in our Upanishads and in our, and in our Shastra. So how many devatas are out there? What is our view on this? I'm just going to pass there for a minute and get you all woken up again. So how many do you think are there? How many devatas? Any volunteers, please? Yes, Madhur, 33 crores. Okay, uh, Padmaja, thank you, 33 crores. Anybody else has a different view? 33 devatas. 33 devatas, Manjunadji. Okay, thank you. So there are two views here. So one is 33 devatas and 9 crore devatas. So either 9 crore devatas or 33 crore devatas. So there are two schools that think about it. So can somebody explain? So Padmaja or Manjunath, can you substantiate? Uh, where did you get that information about 33 crores? Or Manjunath ji, why do you think there are 33 crores? So Pragnesh, you're right. I your thought 30, 33, actually crore means, I think in real meaning, it's one. Koti means one, I think. So 33 crore actually means 33 numbers. And mm -hmm. probably they, you can count them. For example, there are 12, uh, like that, there are about numbers and they count 33. Yeah. But that crore, I think is a misnomer for some reason. So okay. because the, I mean that's my that's what I think I remember whatever I read because yeah. I was puzzled for thirty three crores and thirty three devatas. Yeah. Thank you, Manjunath ji. Uh, fantastic. Anybody else? Paresh, you had uh, Pragnesh, you know, you had raised your hands. Yes, I my understanding is that koti has two meanings. Koti is crore, but koti is also types. So there are thirty three types of deities rather than thirty three crores. So. That's my understanding that Koti is misinterpreted by someone as crore while well, they are trying to say type. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, any other views there? Okay, so that's my mother giving the answer as well. Yeah, thank you. So, any other views there? Okay, so I think uh, uh, all, all views very, very uh, well taken and well contributed because I'm very pleased that we are not assuming there is only, of course, there is only one Brahman. But one thing that I can take from this discussion is that there are very many divinities in Sanatana Dharma of various types and various capacities and attributes. And uh, Manjunath ji was talking about 33. So that is also uh, very interesting. It comes in uh, uh, an Upanishad, Manjunath ji, in Brahadaranik Upanishad. There is a discussion between Shakalya and Yagnyavalkya. So it's called Shakalya Brahmanam. And there, this is the discussion. So Shakalya asks him how many devatas are there? And then he goes on and lists. So the 33 comes from there as you picked it up. So that is Ashtavasus, um, Dvadasha Aditya, Ekadasha Rudra, Indra and Prajapati. So those are all the 33 that come in Shakalya Brahmanam. So anyway, so 33 crores, the crores, whether it is Koti is a type or whether there are really crores of devatas, uh, I leave it up for discussion. But one thing we all accept is there are pluralities of divinities. Yeah, One school believes nine crores, another school believes 33 crores. Okay, so now one point there is assuming there are say nine or 33 crore divinities spread across the universe. So we need to be thinking about this, this expanse of the universe, not just this Bhumi or this Prithivi, but actually having this universal approach to consciousness, universal approach to sentient beings. So if we 
if we trust the numbers either 9 or 30 33 crores numbers of devatas are there let us not forget so all these devatas are also anu they are all a type of jivas whether you like or not they are a type of jivas some exalted jivas and some not so exalted jivas like us and we are an infinite group so we as jivas are infinite its number whereas these parivara devatas of the supreme brahman as described in the upanishads or the divinities that are spread across the universe there are very many that are described in the upanishads and in our shastras so the key there is when sadrishya and pradhanya is being described in uddalaka we need to have that universal approach of sadrishya between the supreme brahman and all his parivara and all other sentient beings including us the infinite jivas is via jnanananda this chap is supremely jnanananda that we all know so the sadrishya is always only between sentient beings and the supreme brahman and similarly the pradhanyatva is purely described by uddalaka in this particular work in chapter 6 is around the dependence of all other sentient beings to this supreme brahman now that view of these several crores of divinities spread across the universe an infinite numbers of universe and i think we have done it at some point either during creation or the journey of souls to describe that concept that this is not this is not unusual because this is totally scientific yeah why is it a scientific look at the observable universe and i've given you these numbers here in the observable universe there are about 10 to the power of 12 galaxies is the estimation nobody has physically counted these things but our astrophysicists tell us there are at least 10 to the power of 12 galaxies so if you take our own milky way there are about 10 to the power 12 stars in our own galaxies and if you take the number of stars in the universe there are about 10 to the power 24 stars in the universe so when krishna says in chapter 15 third verse narupam asya ih tatha upalabhyate na antaha na cha adihi na cha sampratishta who has seen the beginning middle or the end of this material universe nobody else has seen i know the i know everything but has anybody else seen it there are so many of this universe stars and planetary systems around look at our own galaxies there are 40 billion planets in our own galaxy in this one milky way there are 40 billion planets and the current estimation is one in five stars could have planet that support life the nearest earth like one is around 12 light years away so this view of the current prevailing you know uh, thesis in astrophysics is perfectly in synchrony with the views of our vedic rishis who have always believed that life is everywhere in the universe not just in this in this third planet in the solar system but it is there all over the universe and they are or th- such life has got sentient beings and those sentient beings are similar to this brahman but they are all dependent on brahman whether it is on earth or anywhere else okay so i think when we look at uddalaka we need to have the grand vision of the universe also at that time so i just thought i'll bring it in to remind you of that session that we did and how we apply to the philosophy of uddalaka here so then what did he say so to prove that idea of pradhanyatva he said the first the first example of pradhanyatva was this brahman alone existed before creation sadeva somya idam akra asi then what did he did he he went through the sequence of verses in those sequence of verses he described to us how from brahman tejas came chaturmukha then how from chaturmukha mukya prana came or vayu then how from mukya prana vayu annam or rudra or shiva came and how when we take about this uh, divi- these devatas we also have to take their consorts so this will be saraswati bharvati saraswati bharati and parvati okay so they all appeared at that point at the, uh, they all appeared in creation so that is how he was talking about the preeminence so he was the one first one who existed and from him he instructed he made sure that these beings came into being and following these three the rest of the universe came into being 
so in our sanatana dharma it is not only vishnu and lakshmi who are very very important but chaturmuka saraswati mukya prana and vayu and shiva and parvati are also extremely important because these three vastus these three divinities are there all over the universe they have a portfolio in brahmanda they have a portfolio in pindanda and they create everything else in the universe under the control and guidance of supreme brahman is the view certainly in this particular chapter so how did our uddalaka then explain this he gave examples of brahmanda and he said how trivra trivra the mixing up of things that happens you can go back and, and revise those slides so essentially he was telling how brahmanda came into existence and then uddalaka said if you want to remember how the stages of anannam chaturmukha lakshmi ap mukya prana shiva and parvati how they have a role to play in brahmanda if you want to remind yourselves of that he gave four examples to us he, he told us about the fire he told us about the sun the moon and the lightning where he gave if you you will see these three colors red white and dark color red denoting chaturmukha or lakshmi white denote, denoting uh, mukya prana also called vayu and the dark color denoting shiva or also called rudra so he told us that a few weeks ago we we discussed that as to how in brahmanda we can remind ourselves how these three exalted divinities are in, are involved in creation then it when it comes to pindanda last week we spoke about how in pindanda uh, even our body which is also made of only matter and this matter again has got components that should when we contemplate should remind us about Uh, about the greatness of lakshmi chaturmukha mukya prana and shiva in what way he last week we discussed about how when we eat food or when we drink or when we eat certain type of food called tejas so he talked about three uh, three things that we consume to stay alive tejas and apanannam and how last week we discussed about how each component annam for example in the body is processed in three ways gross middle and subtle yeah how annam becomes gross middle and un, uh, and subtle and how water becomes gross middle and subtle in our body and how tejas becomes gross middle and subtle and the subtle components we know is mano vak prana okay so he discuss so look at all this there are three everywhere and three three types of uh, things that we eat three ways in which it's process and the three divinities and so on and uh, it is no surprising that over the centuries this concept of trimurtis had also come into being in the sanatana dharma and in the trimurtis what have we taken we have taken the supreme brahman we have taken chaturmukha brahma and we have taken shiva in this sequence yeah we have not taken lakshmi because lakshmi is assumed here we have not included mukya prana in popular sanatana dharma so these becomes trimurtis 1 2 and 3 then there is 1 2 3 in the 1 2 and 3 they conduct the whole affairs of the universe from creation to maintenance to destruction etc so this is how the concepts of threes come into being so coming back to this food which is very important for pindanda yeah so we constantly ask this question yeah we eat to survive or to survive to eat and i'm going to break there for a minute what are our views here because we last week we discussed about this three things that we throw into our mouth annam aap and tejas which become three different components so what is our view here in samsara we eat to survive or we survive to eat can i have some folks uh, come in here please okay so i'm sure you will all agree with me that we eat to survive i hope at least that's right we eat just to survive there are some people who survive to eat okay but at least the, the ones that are more towards higher purpose in life eat and drink to survive but there are others for whom eating and drinking is a source of pleasure and they eat, they survive because they then can wake up in the morning and eat and drink okay so that is also important for you to think about because i'm going to come to that in a, in a couple of slides take this up in detail about in samsara what are we doing 
Now what Uddalaka does is he is still in that phase of describing, he is giving illustrations to Shweta Ketu to explain to him how in your daily lives, everything that is happening to your body, you are not actually in control. This is the stages up and annam under the direction of the Supreme that is actually running your body, which is a, a Supreme machine. And that machine is a well-oiled machine as long as it is looked after properly. And that well-oiled machi machine is actually run by Tejas Aap Annam under the supreme guidance of Brahman. Okay, To illustrate that, he's, he, that is what he is trying to illustrate. Again, to show Sarvan Aditya Mahamana Anuchanamani is such a wrong concept. You can, just cannot be egoistic. And in our daily life, we need to accept that we are totally dependent beings. So to bring home that idea again, so to bring home that idea again, Uddalaka still is, in, is discussing samsara and he goes into the three states of consciousness. So again, see here, your, Uddalaka is talking about a number of threes here. So now he is going to go into the three states of consciousness, which is what we are going to talk about today. So in the very next khanda, he says, Uddalako, Uddalako, Arunihi, Shvetaketum, Putram, Uvacha. And he goes on and explains the states of consciousness. So let's do the first two verses. It's a very beautiful verse, worth remembering. At least the second verse is my favorite verse of Chandogya. So Uddalako, Arunihi, Shvetaketum, Putram, Uvacha. Swapnantam me somya vijani hiti. Yetra yetat purushaha. Swapiti nama sata somya tada sampanno bavati. Swam apito bavati. Tasma denam. Swap iti achakshate. Swam hi apito bavati. Sayata shakunihi sutre na prabaddo. Disham disham patitwa. Anyatra ayatanam alabdva. Bandana meva upashrayate, eva meva kalu somya, tan mano, disham disham patitva, anyatra ayatanam alabdva, prana meva upashrayate, prana bandanam hi somya manaiti. Okay. So that is his first philosophy that Uddalaka puts forward when he is describing the three states of consciousness of jivas in samsara. So, what is that he is talking about? three states of consciousness of the jivas. So we have done Mandukya Upanishad. So that should come back to a memory now about the three states of consciousness. And here Uddalaka picks up one, one of the, the third state of consciousness before going to number two and number one state of consciousness. So again, I'm going to break there for a minute. Who is going to remind us of the three states of consciousness of jivas in samsara? Pragnesh. Thank you very much. Jagrat, Swapna, and Susupta. And then very good. Four, four straight uh, Turiya, but that is fourth that we all aim for. Thank you very much. Excellent. Good. Uh, great answer, Pragnesh. So, yes, so Pragnesh is absolutely right. So, Mandukya Upanishad, when we did Mandukya Upanishad, it spoke to us about the three states of consciousness of the jivas in the state of samsara. What is this? Jagratistano, Bahihi Pratnyaha, Saptangaha, Ekona Vimshati Mukaha, Stula Book, Vaishwana Raha Pratamaha Padaha. Stopnastanaha, Antaha Pratnyaha, Saptangaha, Ekona Vimshati Mukaha, Pravivik the Book, Tejaso, Dvitiya Padaha. Yetra Shupto, Nakinchana Kamam Kamayate, Nakanchana Sopnam Pashyati, Tat Sushuptam, Sushuptistana, Eki Bhutaha. Pratyana Gana Eva Ananda Mayohi Ananda Book Cheto Mukaha Pragnaha Tritiya Padaha. So these are the we've spent hours talking about these states of consciousness from psychology, neurochemistry, philosophy, and, and so on. What Varuna has to tell us about this. So we have discussed this in great detail. So as Pragnesh pointed out, these are the three states: Jagratistana, Swapnastana, and Sushupti Sthana. So what our Uddalaka now does is he takes the third state of consciousness to illustrate the concept of utter dependence of the jiva 
on the supreme okay? so he says uddalako arunihi shvetaketum putram vacha swapnantam me somya vijanihi thi okay so my dear son i'm going to now talk to you about swapnantam okay so we need to think about what does that word swapnantam means so it means swapna sthanam swapnantam that means when does this swapna happens for example it happens in nidra avastha or during a sleep state yeah so that is called swapna sleep state is called swapnantam the other way of looking swapnantam is after dream swapna antam once a dream is complete what happens we go to dreamless sleep which is called sushupti okay so in the nidra avastha the second component of the sleep state called as the dreamless sleep state i am going to tell you about this swapnantam me somya vijanihi iti and he says yatra etat purushaha swapiti nama okay so what does it mean purushaha purushaha me you know purushaha means that jeeva which is in a gross body so we say yatra etad this purusha swapiti nama he is in deep sleep okay so uddalak says what does it actually mean to say that this jeeva is in deep sleep what does it mean have we thought about it we all go to bed every day we read a book then we drift into sleep we probably dream then we go to a state of dreamless sleep then we go around again with dreams or uh, and then we'll go back to so the, we go back and forth in that sleep and finally we wake up so what is this state called deep sleep what actually happens in deep sleep is what uddalaka is actually asking when you say somebody is in deep sleep what does it mean to say that somebody is in deep sleep so i'm going to pause there for a minute because we all are familiar with this concept i'm just going to get one of our friends to talk about what does it mean to be in deep sleep who is going to take that on okay so um i'll pick that on so uddalaka de says यत्र डेफिनेशन ऑफ डीप स्लीप सता मीन वॉट सत् सदेव सौम्य इदमग्र आसी सो दट सत् दट वॉज देर बिफोर क्रिएशन that sat which is brahman that sat is the sata here somya tada sampanno bhavati so when this jeeva goes and lies on the lap of the supreme being that state is called as swapiti okay is the definition that uddalaka gives okay in deep sleep we have no consciousness of the external world or the internal workings of the mind we are just there and the uddalaka describes that the jeeva is in close proximity with this sat sat som sada somya tada sampanno bhavati that is the situation that we call as swapiti that is deep sleep now think about this deep sleep swapiti why do we say that this man is in swap so uddalaka himself gives the etymology of what swapiti is and as you know without having etymology there is no way in which we could read upanishads of actually breaking the word open so here uddalaka himself helps us and he breaks the swap what it is swap means swapiti is the shortened form of swam apito bhavati so that is what he says here yatra etat purushaha swapiti nama sata somya tada sampanno bhavati swam apito bhavati tasmadenam swapiti achakshate swam hi apito bhavati okay so he stresses that twice giving that means that this is the state of deep sleep swam apito bhavati okay swam apito means what swam plus apita what is swam swam 
means swatantram swam is a shortened form of swatantram who is swatantram swatantro bhagavan vishnu this is what the shastras tell us so what are the two entities in the universe swatantram aswatantram cha dvividam tatvam ishyate swatantro bhagavan vishnu okay so we should never forget that statement swam is the name of supreme lord swam is the name of brahman or vishnu okay this so swam apitaha so this is an important word apitaha means to enter into or goes into okay so now what watch the language of uddalaka and i i like this language watching the language of uddalaka because uddalaka is not saying he becomes the same as swam all that he says is this jeeva goes and enters into the supreme this is like me entering into my house when i enter into my house i don't become the house house is still there i am still there i have just apitaha of my house i have just entered or gone into my house so apitaha means just entered into or gone into not aikya there you don't become one with the, you don't become the same as swam yeah so watch that word which is important here at least if you are in that mode of thinking so swam apitaha bhavati okay so this is an interesting concept yes okay we get it third state of consciousness could be but still how can i understand and as i've told you several times before our uddalaka is a great philosopher who gives practical example so immediately he takes a beautiful example here to describe the situation of the jivas he says sayata shakunihi sutrena prabaddo disham disham patitva अन्यत्र आयतनम अलब्धा बंधनमेव उपाश्रयते सो व्हाट डज इट मीन सो देयर इज अ बर्ड द बर्ड हैज बीन टाइड टू अ पिलर थ्रू अ स्ट्रिंग ओके द बर्ड इज कॉल्ड शकुनी इन संस्कृत ओके एंड देन प्रबद्धो मींस इट इज टाइड ओके टाइड थ्रू व्हाट थ्रू अ सूत्र सूत्रेन व थ्रेड इट इज टाइड okay so where does it tied it is tied to a pillar a post whatever you want to call it so you might have many people have pets you might see all these people who who uh, walk their dogs on the road how do they walk their dogs dog is there there is a string and somebody is holding and they are walking similarly there is a bird strung it is uh, strung to it is uh, stuck to a pillar it is tied to a pillar through a string so this bird is us in this example this bird is the jiva so what is this jiva doing this bird during the waking state it is flying everywhere it is flying everywhere when it is flying everywhere it seems to think that it is independently flying everywhere but actually it is tied through this rope to a pillar so स यथा शकुनि सूत्रेण प्रबद्धो दिशं दिशं पति अन्यत्र आयतनमलब्धवा बंधनमेव उपाश्रयते सो व्हाट हैपेंस ड्यूरिंग द डे टाइम दिस बर्ड इज फ्लाइंग एवरीवेयर बट इट इज नॉट गेटिंग इट्स हैप्पीनेस और इट इज नॉट इट इज नॉट इंडिपेंडेंटली एबल टू डू एवरीथिंग बट स्टिल इट कैरीज ऑन फ्लाइंग हियर एंड देयर एंड इवेंचुअली बाय नाइट टाइम इट इज टायर्ड सो व्हेन इट इज टायर्ड व्हाट हैपेंस bandhanameva eva upashrayate so it will come back and tie and sleep next to this pillar to which it has been tied to evameva kalu somya tan mano disham disham patitva anyatra ayatanam alabdva pranameva upashrayate prana bandhanam hi somya mana iti this exactly is our situation swetaketu is what uddalaka says there we as humans we are called here there is two words here watch these words manaha and pranaha so what does mana means what is pranaha means we all know in colloquial thinking manaha means the mind pranaha means the breath but unfortunately or fortunately the language of the vedic upanishad is slightly different 
manaha there means it is a shortened form of manana shilaha manaha manana shilaha who what is manana shilaha that which is capable of deep contemplation engaging its intellect and thinking about things okay who can do that in whom is this highly evolved it is highly evolved in humans but others have it to various proportions so manana shilaha manushya manushya we are called manushyas and the english word man comes from manushya okay why because we are manana shilaha that is why we are also called manaha so in this example when he says evam eva kalu somya tan mano so that jiva disham disham patitva in the day time like us it is running around like headless monkeys going to work going to shopping going buying this doing that doing all sorts of stuff and by evening this jiva is tired and then it goes to sleep like the bird and when it goes to sleep what is its state in that sushuti state bandhanam eva upashrayate prana bandhanam eva upashrayate so this sutra this sutra is what we call as pranaha who is the op this pranasya pranaha so if you go to um, keno upanishad for example in the second verse pranasya pranaha is the name given to the supreme brahman he is the prana of prana he even gives volition to prana so this jiva is tied to this pranasya pranaha through this prana okay and he is close approximation with this pranasya prana so bandhanam eva upashrayate prana bandhanam hi somya manaiti that is the state of deep sleep okay so that is a beautiful example of what our state of life in samsara is when we go through these three states of consciousness this particular verse actually captures that extremely well and it gives you an illustration of what the deep sleep state is where this jiva then goes to the close approximation of bandhana so again you watch the language you need to watch the language here pranam eva up ashrayate okay up means what next to ashrayate means what placed what's the language up ashrayate it has not become the pranasya prana it is up ashrayate okay so when our friends of other schools read these verses they somehow seems to forget these language of the upanishad and those verses and somehow they feel this jiva will actually merge with brahman in deep sleep and again when it wakes up it will wake up as 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 the same jiva again that may be a hypothesis but that is not the language of uddalaka we are interested in understanding what is it that uddalaka is telling us uddalaka certainly he is telling that pranam eva upa ashrayate this jiva goes and sleeps next to this pranasya pranaha so this is the state of deep sleep and in that state what is our situation we are completely unaware of the external world we are completely unaware of the activity of the mind we are just there helplessly there are many people who lose their lives in deep sleep and if a burglar comes into our house we have no idea who is who is come and stolen things out if somebody if a snake is sitting on our head we will still do not know that it is there because we have no contact with the external world so we are totally dependent state that is a classic definition of how utterly dependent we are on this pranasya prana so again the same question comes again how can you be egoistic how can you be you know sitting standing like like a pillar not doing namaskara to me when that is your situation uddalaka is reminding us so when this i hope you find this important because we'll come in the next slide to talk about this a bit more because this concept of the bird and the thread and the pillar to which it is tied is is a very deep philosophical concept so before i go to the next one i'm going to invite um, maybe veena kankanwadi ji to take us through the seventh verse of the seventh chapter here veena ji are you there yeah yes no. 
ಮತ್ತ ಪರತರ ನಾಣ್ಯತ ಕಿಂಚಿದಸ್ತಿ ಧನಂಜಯ ಮೈ ಸರ್ವಿದ ಪ್ರೋತ ಸೂತ್ರೇ ಮಣಿಗಣ ಇವ thank you so much veena ji thank you so look at that word sutra that comes in in gita chapter 7 so that sutra actually implies two things yeah sutra means prana pranasya pranaha so both things are there so this jiva everything in this universe everything in the universe including jiva jata and jadas or under the control of pranaha and pranasya pranaha is controlling him so here that sutra becomes very important and if you look it with this particular verse and think about the philosophy of uddalaka then this verse of krishna opens up in several different angles so we move on to the next slide here i'm just reminding you of this this situation of sushupti state where you know as i said before there is nothing there is no contact with the external world and the contact between the mind and the jiva is also not there and this is just this jiva with his linga sharira that is just there okay swam apito bhavati okay so here i have a question so if this is the situation where we where the jiva is actually in close proximity with the supreme being in the de- in the dreamless sleep state what is the difference between sushupti and moksha then so we have also learned that moksha or or the state of mukti or liberated state is also a state where we are in close proximity with the supreme we are in synchrony we are in synchrony with supreme is that state of moksha so then what is the difference between sushupti and moksha so who wants to take up this question um you don't have um uh sakshatkara so you you don't see the supreme you are just next to the supreme in sushupti whereas in moksha you would be seeing the supreme seeing as in i'm not saying visual seeing it's experience whatever word you want to use yeah thank you devil anybody else i thought shushrut had the unmuted yes hello madhu uh, oh, nita in, yeah yeah in sushupti there is adnyana although we are close but we don't know that yeah thank you uh, nita ji so yeah both devil and nita got got it right so it is in both states we are in close proximity of the supreme whereas in sushupti state we are av- not aware that we are actually in close proximity and in synchrony with the supreme whereas in the moksha state the jiva is constantly aware of its close approximation with the supreme and it is in tune with the supreme so that is the difference between sushupti and moksha and again we have dealt with this before this sushupti is very important not only to show us how utterly dependent we are on the supreme but at the same time to remind us that actually in samsara every day we are going to that state but we don't remember that we are in the close approximation of the supreme and it asking you to remind yourself how good that state would be when you actually are constantly aware of your close approximation with the supreme that is the state that you need to go for and as you know varuna then talks about turiya state as pragneshti mentioned and that is the fourth stage beyond sushupti that varuna talks about in mandukya upanishad okay so now let's just remind ourselves here before we go to the next idea so ignorance of dependence total dependence and we need to contemplate this every day was what the message of varuna was and is also the message of uddalaka what are the three states wakeful state dream state and dreamless state so we go between these three states in our daily life yeah but actually in all these three states and uh, uddala and varuna has created described that very well in mandukya upanishad that we understood from those sessions that in every phase of the consciousness of the jiva it is dependent on the supreme so again the same question here uddala kai is reminding sarvan vedan aditya mahamana anuchanamani stabda yeyaya how can you be like this standing like the pillar with full of ego dependence is evident in dreamless sleep and dream state okay that is fine that he has mentioned but what about in the wakeful state what is actually happening in the wakeful state 
yet we are not aware of our dependence on the supreme even in wakeful state or dependence on tejas apannam annam remember in this section when he talks about the the sushupti state he is purely talking about the interaction between the jiva and the paramatma he is not bringing tejas ap and annam in the equation but now he says you know what i'm going to bring you back to that some other state of samsara where tejas ap and annam are still regulating your wakeful state in the in the in the uh, in samsara so for that we have to do a simha avalokana jnana we have to look go back and and remind ourselves those sequence that uddalaka had described because unless we remind ourselves of the sequence we will not be able to grasp what uddalaka is saying it is a very very interesting i wouldn't say complicated but you need to think about it you need to think about the sequence it's like an algorithm of how the relationship operates in the wakeful state so how how did it go the uh, the revision tad tad aikshata bahusyam prajayeti tat tejo asrujata tat tejo aikshata bahusyam prajayeti tad apo asrujata tasmad yatra kvacha shochati svedate va purushaha tejasa eva tad apo jayante so like how from brahman came tejas from tejas came an aap and from aap came annam so before talking about annam he talks about how from brahman tejas came and from how tejas aap came and he gave a practical example what practical example he gave when it is hot you sweat so when there is tejas from the, because of tejas sweat came similarly because of tejas aap came so he gives a practical mnemonic or an or an example for us to remind ourselves and remember that sequence tasmad yatra kvacha shochati shochati means heat or when it is very warm svedate va purushaha does the man not sweat tejas eva tad apo jayante similarly from tejas chaturmukha or lakshmi mukhya prana came is what he is saying and in the very next verse what did he say नाइस फील्ड्स आर ग्रीन एंड दे मेक अ लॉट ऑफ फूड देन यू हार्वेस्ट इट देन यू गेट अन्नम सो फॉर अ गुड हार्वेस्ट एंड फूड यू नीड गुड रेन रेन इज वाटर सो लाइक हाउ व्हेन यू हैव लॉट ऑफ वाटर यू गेट फूड सिमिलरली व्हेन देयर इज फ्रॉम फ्रॉम आप अन्नम केम फ्रॉम वायु मुख्य प्राण शिवा रुद्रा केम under the control of tejas under the control of the supreme being is the philosophy or the sequence of philosophy there so remember this heat and sweat water and food for us to go to the next next concept that uddalaka is telling us about how utterly dependent we are in the state of wakeful state so what is that verse we'll read through this verse before we go to the verse ashana pipase me somya vijani hiti ंग pipase means drinking water okay i given you those example ashanaya pipase so this is what our state of living is in the wakeful state nobody can deny this what do we do in the wakeful state we do two things we eat we drink of course we sleep and he has dealt with what happens in sleep already but here he is taking eating and drinking is what we are doing to sustain ourselves now this is a picture i took from my backyard yesterday so in our backyard we got two trays one usually there is a oat or some seeds and then there is a tray with water 
for the birds to come and, and do this. And that's what the birds do throughout the day. They come, they'll eat some seeds and then they'll go here, they'll drink some water and then, then fly away. I've just got a, got a pigeon here. There were two pigeons. Unfortunately, one of the cats has come and eaten the other pigeon. So there is just one left. So this pigeon does it every four hours. All that it does in our backyard is eat the seeds, drink the water. No different from us, Ashana and Pipase. These two, Ashana and Pipase, is imprinted in our, in our if, if you want to call it as your genome or in your mind, whatever, it is imprinted uh, even at the time of birth. It is not something that humans or animals have actually learned as they grow, but it is already there when they are born. Look at the newborn baby. As soon as it comes out, when it cries, what does it ask for? Food. Yeah. Milk, that not only is the food for it at that stage, but it also quenches its thirst. So that is imprinted in the jivas. It is imprinted in, the, in, in, in animals and humans, ashana and pipase. So Uddalaka takes this practical example. He says, look at your daily life of samsara. Forget about your three states of consciousness, which seems very clever and very esoteric. Look at what you are doing now. And currently, we are also doing the same thing. No different from Uddalaka's time. What is that? Ashana and Pipase. So Uddalaka asks here, have you actually thought about this problem? Why do we eat? And why do we drink? It is, we just do this. We just do it automatically. We eat and drink. And we think, oh, we eat and drink because we need to sustain this body. That is all well and good. But have you asked the deeper question? Why is it that we feel hungry? Why is it that we feel thirsty? How does this, this physiology and psychology of hunger and thirst, how does it come? Have you thought about this, Shweta Ketu? So that is what it says. Yatra yetat purushaha ashishishati nama. So ashishishati is a very nice word. I, I love this word, ashishishati. Ashishishati means desires to eat. Okay. So now I have a small question quiz here for us to again have the discussion. So we know our own situation. So we are the jiva. And outside us is this subtle covering, linga sharira as we call it, which is what we are always with. Jivas are always with linga sharira. Ever since uh, they come in, even before they come into this brahmanda, they are always with linga sharira, the jivas. Their creation, as you know, is acquisition of a gross body. So here I have a cartoon of a human who's got a gross body, but the jiva is there with a the linga sharira. So now the question here is, who is getting hungry here? That is what Uddalaka is asking. He is asking you deeper philosophy. Yeah. So who gets hungry? Is it the jiva, or is it the jiva with the subtle body? Or is it the jiva with the subtle body which is covered by the gross body? So who is getting hunger here? Who gets the desire to eat? So what do we think in this group? So who gets the desire to eat? Can I have contributions here, please? No, it can't be the jiva. Deva, can you repeat that? It can't be just the jiva. Why? Like, Why do you think so? Because then jivas in moksha don't eat, do they? Okay, good question. Good answer. So jiva, as you know, is non-material. Uh, mm -hmm. So all the jiva is is jnanananda maya. So for jiva, all that it has or needs is only jnanananda. It doesn't eat food because it, it is not material. So you're right in that sense. Jiva does not get hungry for food. So, uh, Shushrut, Nita, uh, maybe Veena, did you unmute? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it has to be the gross body. It can't be the subtle body either. The subtle body is too simple to want to eat. So, it has to be the gross body that needs gross food. Yeah. Well done, Shushrut. Thank you for that excellent answer. So, I think uh, Deval is right. And, uh, Madhu, Shushrut... I have one question. Yes, Jesus. Then, yes, if the, only the gross body feels hungry, uh, why do we give this Pitru Tarpan every year? Excellent question, uh, Shilaji. The answer to that is, this is where the uh, things have got a little bit skewed up in, our, in the way we practice our Sanatana Dharma. You are absolutely right. The, the jivas that have left this body when we do Shraddha, when we do Tarpana, 
that jiva with linga sharira will not come and eat the spinda that you have kept when you do shraddha so the purpose of shraddha really is you worship the pitru devatas who are the pitru devatas vasu rudra aditya yama so those are all the deities who are being Ashtavasus. worshiped in the shraddha is it ashtavasus yeah ashtavasus vasu rudra aditya so when you do shraddha you would have heard all these things vasu rudra aditya so the the, the pinda pradana is is actually a worship of the pitru devatas you worship them then to say please can you make sure that this jiva with linga sharira has a proper destination that it will its onward journey is without any hindrance please can you do that that is the prayer in shraddha it is nothing to do with this our ancestors then coming back and then eating this pinda or coming back as a crow and eating pinda i will uh, i i will yeah, keep because that aniket aside. aniket was asking this question you see why do we call yeah. crows you know to come and eat yeah, pinda yeah. so all those things have come in part of the superstition but the philosophy there is you are worshiping the pitru gana devatas pitru gana devatas there are many and the primary ones are vasu rudra and aditya yama so those are all the ones that you pray in this so your jiva with linga sharira does not actually eat gross food so in that sense shushrut is correct that it is the jiva with the gross body that is actually gets hungry the jiva with linga sharira does not get hungry that is the view they may be getting hungry but we do not know but the shastras are not saying that they get hungry jivas of course as deval ji mentioned they are nyanananda they are non material they don't need this material food so they are not hungry at all yeah so that is the first thing that we have to agree there yeah so let's go back to this verse ashana pipase me somya vijani hiti yatra etat purushah ashishishati nama ap eva tad ashitam nayante so so all these verses become sensible and logical only when we understand tejas ap and annam are not some jadas that are being described but they are actually some sentient beings that are being described that's why over the last several classes we have spent a lot of time of imprinting our brains that tejas means lakshmi and chaturmukha uh, ap means mukhya prana annam means shiva parvati rudra so all those things we have to remember because then it becomes important so look at this word aap eva tad ashitam nayante so what does that mean when you read that aap water controls the food nayante water controls the food okay so a jada one jada does not control another jada is only one sentient being that controls another sentient being so again the language of the upanishad is adi deva you have to look at adi deva interpretation when you look at that then it opens up in various ways and i'll tell you how it opens up here so now let us talk about appetite yeah what is appetite and hunger actually is in physiology for those of you who are of medical predisposition here so you all know about, we all know about this stomach that these i've just listed a few i just picked it up from google images to 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 to, to, to illustrate a concept how does hunger come about because that is what audalaka is saying ashishishati nama desire to eat is hunger so udalaka is saying how does the desire of for food comes about have you thought about it let us look at current medical physiology how does it happen so you eat goes to the stomach process in the intestine goes to the liver your islets do insulin you need insulin to process all the stuff your muscles play a role then you have the adipose tissue okay the current view is there are various hormones that these these organs secrete adipose tissue secretes leptins stomach Uh, secretes a hormone called ghrelin ghrelin okay so ghrelin and the intestines in keratin so these are all some of the hormones so there are two hormones current i'm just giving you a current hypothesis there leptins and ghrelins these are the two hormones that go to the hypothalamus which is in your brain they go to the hypothalamus and their levels influence the hunger the the hunger sensation that you get okay that is the physiology 
that is all well and good in the material platform but our uddalaka is a philosopher par excellence he is asking that is all fine ghrelins and leptins going to the hypothalamus interacting with the receptors and el eliciting some electrical activity but then still how does it create the sense of hunger that is what his, his question is so how does it happen so these hormones go to the hypothalamus they create a, a receptor versus ligand interaction that elicits an electrical signaling in the brain that gets processed in the mind that electrical signal in the brain gets processed in the mind then the mind then you have the intellect component of the mind which is okay i'm getting these sensations through the mind now i am hungry it decides okay i am hungry and then it then goes and starts ashana this is the sequence which nobody can argue that hypothalamus electrical activity mind processing the brain processing the nerve activity the mind processing it further then the intellect making further decisions as to what's happening and then you are eating so the question there is who controls the mind this is what uddalaka's question there is his interpreter who is controlling the mind here that gives you that sensation of hunger so who is going to answer that question who controls the mind uh, I, i have a doubt like i was thinking the hunger controls no as long as the jivatma is associated with the uh, subtle body hankara it, it it is the one which has the desire and once it knows that it is not that then it no longer has the desire so the jiva ultimately is the experiencer so there there is no argument uh, prathiba ji but the this this the here the question is how does the sensation of hunger comes about who controls that hunger the jiva may experience the hunger and then go about and eating but who controls the coming up of that sensation of hunger so i hope the you understand the, way that yeah manchudan ji last time you had told about this loop you no know, the jivatma is in the center and you have that 18 uh, that uh, uh, 17 fences so as long as it is with the fences you know, you are feeling that hunger when you are on the dot When so you, you are feeling that, that, but yeah. So you're right. You're feeling that, but you're not feeling it independently. Somebody else is making it happen. Is the view of Uddalaka. So here, my question was: Who controls mind in general? Who is the Mano Abhimani oh, Deva? Rudra. 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 Yeah. There you go. What is Rudra in our sequence stages? Ap Annam. Rudra Annam. is Annam. Yeah, Annam is the other name for Rudra. Rudra is the one that controls the mind. and that mind processing everything that gives you the sensation of hunger is this the rudra who is controlling it and when the rudra controls that and gives you the hunger what do you go and eat you eat a burger and chips what is the burger and chips made of panchabhutas who is that panchabhuta made from who is the person responsible for all the panchabhutas because pancha tanmatras become panchabhutas so who is the abhimani devata of uh, pancha tanmatras and panchabhutas so where does tejasa ahankara i mean tamasa ahankara comes from tamasa ahankara becomes pancha tanmatras which becomes pancha bhutas and that pancha bhuta has what has become burger and chips okay so who is the tamasa ahankara abhimani who is going to answer that rudra exactly correct so padmaja thank you so it is a rudra so when you go into the deeper aspects of it it makes perfect sense so uddalaka is that is what he is saying here that this this rudra is the person that is controlling your desire there are so many desires you have one desire is desire to eat and then it is a rudra that you are eating because that annam and the chips is actually made of panchabhuta they are all come from tamasa hankara so it is a rudra that that you are eating ashana so that concept of ashana then should take you to a higher level so remember that concept of food and how rudra is involved in that that regulates the desire to eat what happens to the food after we eat he says apa eva tad ashitam nayante so once that that food is there no that food is under the control of apaha who is apaha prana prana is apaha now you know where i am getting at when you put food and you throw it into your stomach it is processed somebody is processing it into five different ways we'll come to that in the next stage so when 
Uddalaka says, Apa eva tad ashitam nayante. You need to remind yourself of the sequence. When the water comes, food comes. So the reverse is true. So this food is dependent on this water. Okay. So this op, this water controls this food, or this prana controls the rudra. So what does that actually mean? This is what it means. So he goes to the next line and says, Tatyata gonayo ashvanayaha purushanaya iti evam tad apa achakshate ashanayeti. So he gives an example. Our man gives example all the time. So what examples he gives? So what is, uh, so in the Vedic times you had horses and you had cows. So a fellow who had a lot of cows used to be called gonaya. Naya means nayaka. It's the abbreviation of nayaka. Nayaka means he who controls. Yeah, Nayaka, Nayante, they're all similar words. So Gonaya means that person who owns all the cows is called Gonaya. That person who owns all these horses is called Ashwanaya. Or the king who controls all the human beings is called Purushanaya. Iti evam, similarly, Tad, Apa, Apa means Ap, Mukya Prana, Achakshate, Ashanayeti. So when you say Ashanaya, it actually means this Mukya Prana that controls the Rudra. How does that happen? When we eat, what happens when we throw that food in? This Prana Tattva process that food into five aspects and they become five different things and go and circulate in the body to do five different aspects. Prana, Udana, Vyana, Samana and Apana. Okay. These five components, and you all know a lot about this already. We can maybe take it up in the next class to discuss this in detail about those five pranas, what happens to the food and how are they processed. I've got 15th chapter, 14th verse. So who uh, I, I would uh, invite one of us to recite this verse here because we need to remember this at this point. Pragnesh. Thank you very much. Aham Vaishwanaro Bhutva Praninam Deha Masrita Prana Pana Sama Yukta Pacham Mennam Chaturvidam. Thank you very much, Pragnesh. Very beautifully recited. So when Krishna says, Aham Vaishwanaro Bhutta Praninam Deha Masrita Prana Apana Sama Yukta Pachami Annam Chaturvidam. We need to think about this sequence here. So Rudra desire for food and he is the food. He goes and throws into the stomach. Then what happens there? Pranagni is there. This fellow is processing five different ways things are going. But, and this fellow is under the control of Lakshmi and Chaturmuka. And these two people are under the control of Krishna. And what is Krishna is saying? I am the one that digests all the food through the sequence of events. So again, when we understand the language of Uddalaka, then this wording, this statement in chapter 15 becomes very, very significant to us. Aham Vaishwanaro Bhutva Praninam Deham Ashritaha Prana Apana Samayuktaha Pachami Annam Chaturvidam. So maybe next time when we do this session, we can get one of our friends to talk about the five, uh, the Pancha Pranas and talk about how the food gets processed. Okay. So now again, Uddalaka, we are, we are coming to the tail end of today's session. So Uddalaka then says another beautiful verse here. Tatra Yetach Shungam Utpatitam somya vijanehi na idam amulam bhavishyatiti. So what does that mean, that verse? When you see shungam, shungam is a, is a key word there. Shungam means a sprout, a shoot. Okay? When you see a small shoot that appears, you immediately know that there is a source for the shoot, which is the seed. Okay? Similarly, when this sprout or the shoot of hunger appears, then you know that there is a source for it okay so the key there is where there is an effect always search for the cause so that is what uddalaka is saying this you got hunger what you should do is oh you should not just stop at hunger and eat and get on with life ask about deeper philosophy as to what is the origin of hunger because what are we doing in this session we are doing upasana this is contemplation of these three entities tejas hapannam who operate under the control of the supreme for all things that happen in the universe as well as in our body so you need to ask what is the cause of the effect hunger that you get in your body after this talk when you get hungry at 6 30 remind yourself of this session as to how that shiva is doing this 
That's how prana is doing this. That's how chaturmukha is doing it under the control of the supreme. And you think about the 14th verse so that we bring it into practical life of the philosophy of the Gita and the Uddalaka. So this is the sequence here. So how does it happen? Tasyakva mulam sad anyatra annadevam eva kalu somya annena sungena apo mulam anvicha. Yeah, and it goes on. So I'll just summarize this because we are running out of time for today's session. So essentially what this verse talks about is when you have food, ask the question, where did the food come from? Then you will answer, if there is no rain or water, there is no harvest, therefore there is no food. So then you will understand it is the water that is actually responsible for the food. Then you ask the question, where did the rain or water come from? Then you will find the answer. It is, if there is no sun, there is no rain. Because the sun absorbs the water from the oceans, makes it into clouds, pours it as rain, and that rain leads to food. So if there is no sun, there is no rain. So Uddalaka goes to the next step. Where did Tejas come from? Where did this, the sun come from? How does it work? So again, I've got this verse. Chapter 15, verse 12. Who is going to recite that for us? Uh, I think Pragnesha's hand is historical. Can we have somebody else to recite 15th chapter 12th verse, please? Yes, I can do it. Yeah, Sure. Shushu. Yada dityagatam tejaha jagad khilam Yet Chandramasi at Chagno, that they jo with the mama come. Beautiful, Sushrut. So there you go, the beautiful answer to that. So when Krishna says, Yet Aditya Gatam Tejaha, Jagat Basa Yate Akilam, Yet Chandramasi at Chagno, that they jo with the mama come. They all have their light and they're able to do because I am inside them. And I make them do that. Okay, So that verse there becomes relevant because Uddalaka finishes this particular section with a very beautiful verse. I would strongly advise you to memorize it. Sanmulaha, Somya, Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha, Sada, Yatanaha, Sat, Pratishtaha is what he will finish this, this particular verse. So this whole sequence that you have, this is the Mula. Sun Mulaha. As I said, Mula means the root, the cause. You always ask about the cause. When there is a when there is a desire for hunger, you ask the cause. When there is food, you ask what is the cause of the food. When you know it is water, you ask what is the cause. Then you know it is a sun, then you ask what the cause. Then you keep going back and back and back. You will reach this sun. Sun means sat. Who is this sat? Sadeva Somya Idamagra Asit Yekameva Advitiyam. Okay. So that sat is the mula. Somya, Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha. Prajaha is important. Praja means sentient beings. Okay. For all these, all these sentient beings, Somya, Imaha, Sarvaha. You can put your hands in Imaha, Sarvaha. All these Jiva Jatas, he is there. He is the Mula, Sat Mulaha. Sat Ayatanaha. Ayatanaha means, Ayatana means shelter. This Sat is their shelter. Sat Ayatanaha. Then he says, Sat Pratishtaha. Pratishtaha means their final destination. Okay. He is their source. Everything is has taken shelter under him and he is the final destination. Sanmulaha, Somya, Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha, Sada Ayatanaha, Sat Pratishtaha. So Uddalaka comes back to this verse in subsequent classes. He brings these three verses. Please memorize it. Sanmulaha, Somya, Imaha, Sarvaha, Prajaha, Sadayatanaha, Satpratishtaha. This is the essence and summary of all of philosophy of Sanatana Dharma. Okay. He is the source of everything. And we are all taken shelter under him. We Prajas, we sentient beings have taken shelter under him. He is our final destination. So to bring it all back into another way of looking at it, look at our daily lives. When we make food, what do we use? We use food 
we use wood make fire we take a vessel we put rice and we put water so we make food and we eat and we survive so what are the three components there there is annam rice aap water fire this is what we use to make food look at our body annam flesh bones etc aap is our blood tejas is our metabolism that creates heat and temperature because without metabolism heat and temperature it is a dead body yeah these three make our us alive annam aap and tejas look at our embryology look at how we have come into being from our parents we have this annam which is this body how does this body came from it came from the liquid called the rethus which is the which is the sperm and where did the sperm come from it came from the tejas that that our parents eat what is the tejas tejas becomes majja majja means bone marrow and the view there is one component of the bone marrow is the spermatogenesis that happens in the testis as you know bone marrow is where you have lot of stem cells right that they make various different types so they regenerate and make stuff the same regeneration process that happens in the in, in physiology maybe in humans the testicles for example where the sperms come from so again uddalaka is asking us to look at all these things it is the same concept that comes again tejas aap annam tejas aap annam tejas aap annam for our very existence who are these tejas aap annam lakshmi chaturmukha mukhya prana saraswat bharati and shiva and parvati so these are the three fellows who are actually making everything happen but they operate under sanmulah somya sarvah prajah sada yatanah sat pratishtaha okay so again uddalaka's view there is look at your daily life how dependent or you are on these three giants as well as the supreme being how can you be proud of yourself and then next time when we touch base we are going to talk about atayatra etat purushah pipasita nama so what does thirst mean and then there is a discussion on what the physiology and psychology and philosophy of thirst and then we make entry into this famous sets of nine verses okay saya esha anima aitadatmyam idam sarvam tat satyam sa atma tatvamasi shvetaketo iti bhuyama eva bhagavan vijnapayatva iti tata somya iti ho vach okay so to know what the philosophy of saatma tatvamasi we have actually spent 10 hours so far over the last seven classes we have spent about 10 hours to understand what the preamble to what uddalaka is going to be teaching us the famous the tatvamasi shrutis that is so celebrated among all schools of vedanta and i hope that over the last seven sessions that we have done you have understood the background to this discussion so this philosophy of saatma tatvamasi shveshaketo needs to be discussed with this background in mind and what we will do is over the next two or three week two or three sessions i think we will be finishing chapter 6 over the next three to four sessions we will pick up these various you know ways in which uddalaka tells his son or teaches his son about saha atma tatvamasi with nine different examples we have already seen how uddalaka has given innumerable number of examples already he is going to give nine more examples to establish certain fundamental concepts in vedanta and we will have i am hoping fruitful discussions because there are diverse views on what this verse means and i'll try and handle it from various schools perspective and then we can make up our own mind as to what appeals to us okay so on that note i'm going to close today krishna pranamastu and we can uh, have any discussions today okay excellent so um any questions Any, anything this is else? not Anjuman? recording i would like to have a question because it's not uh... yeah okay no, sure so uh, yeah um uh, chitra ji do you want to stop the recording i will do madhu